important notes about online learning. Download the slides and go through them along with your video and audio. You will still need to make notes and try and express things in your own words. This is going to be important for your own understanding of the work. You still need to go through your manual and do the work points and you still need to explore further through additional reading and online investigation. For example, YouTube, Wikipedia and the library have wonderful resources for you to use. While doing online learning, it becomes even more important that you do these things. You will need to manage your own time and take more responsibility for your own learning. Enjoy the lecture. The building blocks of sentences, words and phrases. In the last lecture, we learned that language is not random. It's not just a bunch of words plonked one after the other to make some meaning. Language is a system, and language can be described using a generative grammar. A generative grammar is a mental model that creates all and only the sentences of a language. Chomsky and generative grammar has implications for language universals as well. In other words, it aims to describe the grammar of all human languages using a relatively simple set of rules. When we wonder what do speakers know when they know a language, it is not simply that they know words, their meanings, and how to use them, but rather, language speakers know the permissible, acceptable structures in a given language, and they also know if the structure is unacceptable. Although speakers of a language can use actual sentences in that language, it is not the sentences that they know, but rather the underlying structure behind the sentence, and the structuredness of the language system is known as grammar or syntax. The building blocks of this grammar are word categories and the phrases that they are part of. In this lecture, we will look at practical ways of identifying the categories of words, for example, nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Grammatical categories. Words belong to different categories. These are also known as parts of speech. The phrase parts of speech is a bit of a misnomer because language can be expressed in many ways, not just through speech. For example, it can be expressed through writing, uh, through sign languages, etc. These different categories you are probably familiar with. They include nouns, verbs, adjectives, prepositions, adverbs, pronouns, determiners, auxiliaries, modals, and non-modals, conjunctions, complementizers, etc. When we try to identify these categories, there are three main systems we can use. First, we could look at the syntactic relationship to other words. The grammatical category to which a word belongs is largely determined by how it is used in a sentence. In other words, its syntactic position in relation to other words. The second broad set of methods we could use are morphological. Morphology can also play an important role in determining the grammatical category. The third and final set of methods we can use to determine category membership is semantics or meaning. Semantics can play a role in determining the grammatical category. Grammatical categories can be split into two very broad classes, lexical categories and functional categories. The lexical categories would include most nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and maybe some prepositions. The lexical categories are open class, and by that we mean that there is a potentially infinite number of these, and you can always learn some new ones. For example, I could teach you some new nouns right now, such as Jabberwocky, or I could teach you some new verbs, Gaia and Gimbal. Lexical categories also tend to have distinct meanings that you can perhaps look up in a dictionary. So, for instance, if you looked up the word cat in a dictionary, you'd probably be able to find some kind of meaning associated with it. In contrast, the functional categories serve the purpose of driving the grammar or setting up relationships between other words. Functional categories include Pronouns and determiners, auxiliaries, modals and non-modals, conjunctions and complementizers. Functional categories tend to be closed class, and by that we mean there is a finite number of these categories. And we tend to have learned them as part of the language learning process. So, for instance, determiners like the, these and those are functional. They do not have a distinct meaning. So, for instance, it would be hard to look up the in the dictionary and find it any specific meaning associated with it. It doesn't mean it doesn't have meaning, but those meanings tend to be abstract and grammatical meanings as opposed to denoting things in the real world that you can point to. Because these are closed class items, it is very hard, if not impossible, to learn new ones. 
For instance, it would be very difficult to learn a new kind of past tense or a new kind of pronoun. This is basically because these functional categories define the grammatical system and learning new ones would be equivalent to learning a new language. Lexical categories, nouns. Nouns are thing words that denote either physical objects in the world like cat and dog or states of being, things like love and hate and abstraction. And one of the identifying features of nouns is that they can be pluralized morphologically. There are some exceptions, of course, uh, namely for irregular or non-count nouns. So if you take the word dog, you can talk about one dog or two dogs. You'll notice at the end of the word dog, there's a zzz sound that indicates the plural. One child becomes three children. Uh, we, again, we see the word children has changed its form morphologically to indicate plural. However, it's not the case that every noun will pluralize. You can talk about one water, but not three waters or three rice. You can, of course, talk about one glass of water or three grains of rice. So this can be one possible cue that leads us to believe that something might be a noun. Syntactically, nouns can also often be preceded by adjectives or determiners, or by both. And if you think about the noun phrase rule, noun phrase breaks into determiner, adjective, and noun phrase, this should give you an idea. So if you take uh, the phrase a student, the word student is preceded by determiner, that means that student must be a noun. You can also put an, an adjective in there and you get an intelligent student. And the fact that you can do so suggests that student must be a noun. Nouns can also be uh, fairly abstract or have morphological characteristics that make them maybe difficult to identify. So if you look at the sentence, his intelligent betting made him a lot of money. We might ask, well, what is the word betting? How do we know that that's a noun? Well, the one reason it's a noun is because it can have an adjective before it, intelligent. It can also trigger morphological agreement on the verb. So his intelligent betting makes him a lot of money. All of this suggests that this is a noun. Moving on to verbs, morphologically, English verbs can support the following range of affixes. The infinitive form tends to be bear, so in the word to prove, it can have a past tense marker, something like proved. It can have a present tense marker like proves. And of course, a present participle like proving. Syntactically, verbs can be preceded by modal auxiliaries, which is a subclass of verbs. These include can, must, may, will, etc. You can also have the infinitive marker too. So you can talk about they will walk in the yard. Here, walk is preceded by the modal will. You can talk about to walk or not to walk. Here, the infinitive form of the verb is preceded by the marker to. And you can also see that verbs inflect in ways that are triggered by the subject. There are also a variety of adwords. These include adjectives and adverbs. They have more or less the same function insofar as they modify the thing they are connected to. Adjectives, of course, modify nouns. Adverbs modify verbs. One of the important rules of thumb is that in English, an adverb is often associated with a li ending, like luckily or sadly or memorably. This is not true of every adverb, of course. For instance, the adverb well doesn't necessarily end in this way. Syntactically, an adjective or an adverb can often be preceded by an intensifier like the word very. So we can say very lucky or very sad very desperate, very dangerous, or as adverbs, very sadly, very quickly, and very slowly. As an aside, be careful of confusing adverbs and adverbials. The adverb refers to a grammatical category called an adverb, whereas an adverbial could be any grammatical category, but which serves to modify or further specify aspects of the event, for instance, adverbials of time, adverbials of place, adverbials of manner, etc. An adverbial could be an adverb, or, but it could also just as well be a prepositional phrase. So just be careful of confusing adverbials or the adverbial function versus the adverb category. Prepositions. Prepositions generally do not permit any affixes to be attached to them. Syntactically, an English preposition can occur after the word right which means uh, 
completely, or sometimes you can use the word straight, meaning directly. So you can say something like, the car went under the bridge, and you can modify that with, the car went right under the bridge. Maria went to her cousin, Maria went straight to her cousin, etc. You can also use the prepositional phrase rule to determine if something is a preposition or not. The prepositional phrase rule states that a prepositional phrase breaks into a preposition and a noun phrase. So if you have a shortish looking word, like to or from or with or near, which happens to occur before a noun phrase, so long as that shortish looking word is not a determiner, it is probably itself going to be a preposition. The last group of functional categories we're going to look at today are the determiners and complementizers. Determiners precede nouns and specify the noun phrase more tightly. So words like a or the or these or those, several, this, these are all examples of determiners. So we can talk about several students, an intelligent student, this group of girls, etc. A complementizer tends to introduce a sentence. Examples of complementizers are that, if, whether, etc. And they are used to introduce complement clauses. A complement clause is a subordinate clause that serves to complete the meaning of a noun or a verb in a sentence. Here are some examples. The news that she was dead shocked us all. If I were to ask you what shocked us all, you might answer the news that she was dead. This is a complex noun phrase with a relative clause structure. The head noun is the news. There's a complementizer that, which introduces another proposition or another sentence, which is that she was dead. And that tells us something about the news that, that was shocking to us. Another example is, do you mind if I open the door? There are actually two clauses here. Let's look and find the verb. You can see the first verb is mind. And the second verb is to open. So the fact that there are two main verbs suggests that there are two clauses. And of clause one is do you mind? And clause two is I open the door. And these are connected together with a complementizer, namely the complementizer if, to identify parts of speech for ourselves. Here we have a, an example sentence from one of your work points in your tutorial. Uh, the wealthy bureaucrat yawned loudly. We can see that these words together form a sentence, so it has some meaning, and this will help us to identify the parts of speech. Let us start off by trying to identify what's happening, and we could ask the question what's happening, and the answer would be the wealthy bureaucrat yawned loudly. So it's the yawning that seems to be the, the thing that's happening. This is most likely our verb. We can also tell that by the fact that we have a past tense marker on it. We could also replace that with uh, another kind of morphological ending. For instance, uh, yawns, he or she yawns, or they are yawning. These morphological endings tell only fit onto verbs, and so that's telling us that there's probably a verb. Also, a verb has someone who does the action. In this case, it is the wealthy bureaucrat, who is the doer. So all that suggests that this is a verb. We can also put it in, into an infinitive form. Uh, for instance, we can say to yawn. Uh, for instance, I want to yawn. And that infinitive form tells us that this is a verb. Right, let's move on to this phrase, the wealthy bureaucrat. Uh, together, that forms a noun phrase. Is the first question we could ask is, is there a thing you could point to? Um, and the answer would be yes, there is a bureaucrat. And we can also pluralize it. So we can talk about the one bureaucrat or two bureaucrats. And the fact we can pluralize it suggests that we are dealing with a noun. We can also use our noun phrase rule to try and work this out. So a noun phrase breaks into a determiner, a series of optional adjectives, and a noun. We've already identified our noun. And we can see in front of it the and wealthy. Let's start with the. This is a determiner. And we can see that 
from our noun phrase rule, which tells us that a noun can be preceded by a determiner. So there we go. There are a finite number of determiners, so we can memorize most of them. So the, these, those, a, an, etc. What about this word in the middle here, wealthy? Well, this is telling us something about the bureaucrat. It is telling us that the bureaucrat has the characteristic of being wealthy. So it is a, a word that is modifying a noun, which means it's probably going to be one of our uh, adverbs, an adjective or an adverb. In this case, it is going to be an adjective. How do we know that? For two reasons. Adjectives describe nouns and adverbs describe verbs. So this is a noun, so it must be an adjective. We can also look at our noun phrase rule, which tells us that we have a noun phrase, uh, an, a noun and a determiner, and between them there is a space for an adjective, and that's what we see in this position here. So we know that there's an adjective. Which finally leads us to the last word, loudly. And the fact that it has this li ending here is a bit of a clue because many adverbs in English end in a, a li. Not all of them, but it is quite a, a, a common uh, thing that happens. And an adverb must tell us something about the, the verbal event. The event is a yawning event, and the adverb tells us that the event is loud. So you can see that it is modifying a verb, and that tells us that that is probably going to be an adverb. Let's try another example. Have a slightly macabre example from your tutorial. And her tooth rotted and his hair fell out. It's a full sentence, and so it has some meaning, and that's going to mean that we are able to use those meanings to identify the parts of speech. Let's start off by looking for our verbs, the verbs or the doing words, so to speak. Well, first of all, we noted there are two events that happen. The first is that her tooth rotted. That's one event. And the second event is his hair fell out. And if we look carefully, we'll see that there are two verbs, one with each event. So rotted and uh, fall. Uh, is there. So how do we know that these are verbs? Well, we can immediately see that rot has a past tense marker. So rot, it rots, uh, it is rotting, and similarly fell could become fall, falls, falling, all signs that these are verbs. They are also Doers, so to speak. So who is doing the rotting or what is doing the rotting? Well, the answer must be her tooth. So this, the fact that rotting can have a doer suggests that it is a verb. Similarly with fall or fall out, what, what is doing the falling out? Well, it is his hair. And the fact that there is a doer to this tells us that it is a verb. Let's look at the phrase her tooth. Uh, is there a thing we can point to? Uh, and in the real world, the answer is yes, it is tooth. And it could also come in the form of a plural. So one tooth, two teeth. And that tells us that that is a noun. Let us look in this example. A uh, very similar kind of construction. Is there a thing we can point to? That is his hair, yes. And it can be pluralized. It can be hairs. So one hair, two Hairs, and that tells us that that is a noun too. Then we'll notice that before the noun, there is a category which is a possessive pronoun. How would we uh, categorize this? Well, one on, so we know that typically before a noun, you either get an adjective or a determiner. So our noun phrase rule says. A noun phrase breaks into a determiner, several adjectives, which are optional, and a noun. We've already identified the noun, which means that his must be either an adjective or a determiner. So let's see, can we add some more adjectives? We could say something like 
um, his red hair. And even say something like um, his glossy red hair. Now the thing about adjectives is we can switch them around. We could say his red glossy hair. And that would also be completely grammatical. So if his is an adjective, we should be able to switch the word order. So let's try that. Red, his glossy hair, is a sentence, or is a phrase. Red, his glossy hair, that is definitely not a grammatical sounding English phrase. So we know that red cannot be an adjective. Oh, pardon me. So we know that his cannot be an adjective. It must therefore be a determiner. So we're going to write that in as a determiner. When we look at her tooth, exactly the same logic applies. Uh, it's also a possessive pronoun, which is a determiner. So this is actually quite an interesting example because what we've done is we have deduced the properties of a part of speech using rational argument rather than just memorizing it. And that is actually a lot about what linguistics is really about. It's about looking at language in a logical and rational way, making arguments that make sense, and being able to support our claims with evidence. Finally, oh, well, not quite finally, there is this category over here, out. Um, what, what is it actually doing? Well, in this case, it is actually uh, part of a complex verb. So to fall or to fall out, it is actually a, a kind of a preposition, technically called a particle, which we don't cover really at Ling one level. But to fall out is a complex predicate or a complex verb. So fall out together is actually a verb. Finally, what about this category over here? Well, we have and, which links these two sentences together. So if we were drawing that, ooh, so if we wanted to write a schematic of that sentence and sentence, just to make it a bit simpler, and and is linking those two sentences, and it tells us that both the sentences or both propositions and sentences occurred. For one thing that happened was that your tooth rotted, and another thing that happened was that his hair fell out. So this is a coordinator. A coordinator is one of those uh, functional categories, not to be confused with a complementizer. Complementizer is something slightly different. You can, however, if you want, use the word conjunction instead of coordinator. Both of those would be correct. Your classic coordinators are and, or, but, etc. Right, so now that we've talked through an example, I would like you to try the same thing in your tutorials. And at the back of your tutorial chapter, there are some examples, including these, that you can work through for yourselves.